Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, Alex Bozich and I are joined by John Gassaway from ESPN, one of the most insightful college basketball writers out there. And we brought John on to talk about his impressions of the Hoosiers so far this season. Uh, as he mentions, uh, he was early on the uh, Juwan Morgan bandwagon, so we talk about Juwan. We talk about Indiana's ability to win close games and how sustainable that is. And we also look ahead to Indiana's upcoming matchup against Illinois. John is an Illinois fan when he doesn't have his ESPN hat on. Uh, Illinois is the team that he roots for. Obviously, it's a bit of a tough time to be an Illinois fan right now, and so we talk with John about that about you know why it's taken a little while for the Brad Underwood uh, regime to really take hold and start to show success there, uh, and why this game coming up on Thursday may be a little bit trickier than you would think uh, at an initial glance. And we talk a little bit about the Big Ten, too. Always a wide-ranging, interesting, uh, compelling conversation when John is here. So that is what is on tap for you this week. Before we get to that conversation, I want to talk real quick about tickets, because as you know, getting tickets online can be too complicated. There are hundreds of sites, varying levels of reliability, and that makes it hard to know who to trust. But that's why SeatGeek is the place to go, because SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place, which allows you to easily find the seats you want for a price you're willing to pay. There's nothing like being there in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. There are tickets there for the Illinois game if you want to make the last second decision to get to Simon Scott Assembly Hall to watch the Hoosiers as they resume Big Ten play. Obviously, 17 games after that, many of them at home, others in Big Ten road venues, wherever you are. If you want to get a ticket to see Indiana play, go to SeatGeek because they will take good care of you. And SeatGeek is designed to make the ticket buying experience easier than ever by searching multiple ticket sites and grading every ticket based on value. So that helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. And every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. This is why I have the SeatGeek app on my phone. It's why I use SeatGeek when I'm looking for sports tickets, concert tickets, whatever it may be. That's why I go to SeatGeek and why I recommend them to you as well. And best of all, listeners to Podcast on the Brink get $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All you need to do is download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code BRINK today. B-R-I-N-K for $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. And now here's our conversation with John Gassaway. John, welcome back to Podcast on the Brink. Uh, thanks for having me. It's it's good to be here. It is. It is. So uh, obviously we want to we love bringing you on and talking about a number of topics, both IU specific and Big Ten and even national. So let's start small. Let's talk about the Hoosiers. Uh, what are your <laughs> what, what are your impressions so far of Indiana? What do you make to the start of the season? Nothing small about that ever. <laughs> <laughs> big uh, big vistas and big potential. Uh, they you know they they've got to get healthy. Is my <laughs> is yeah. my advanced analytic take <laughs> they've kind of stopped st- stepping in front of uh injury mishaps and uh get get whole and hail and hardy and and other uh rhyming consonants but uh you know if i told you before the season started that you know you'd be looking at 11 and 2 one wipe out against duke notwithstanding and and one point away from being 12 and 1 uh i think most hoosier fans would have taken that i would take that if i were a hoosier fan and uh i would say uh steady as she goes and everything that john gassaway and others wrote in the preseason about hey look out for this romeo langford juan morgan uh combo has has come to fruition more or less so uh, you know times are good we've got two big 10 games uh under the belt and about to start conference uh play for real so the questions will get answered now with with lightning speed but uh i'm not sure there have been you know with the huge asterisk of, of health notwithstanding i'm not i'm not sure there have been a too many uh, surprises, good or bad, to this to this point in the season for IU. How do you judge a team 
like Indiana that has won a lot of close games? Like, do you look at that as a team that is, quote, teetering, as one national college hoops writer said, or do you view the ability to win close games as a strength that can endure as the season moves forward as opposed to just, hey, you know, you got lucky by the bounce of a ball here and happened to win that game? Um, you know, n- most college teams are not Duke, and we do not have the luxury. Or on the other end, uh, there are some teams that would love to play close games but, but lose them all. Uh, but most uh, a, a solid uh, share of, of Big Ten teams uh, play close games as a matter of course. And if you play those and are winning them, then you're happy. But it is true that uh, – over the very, very long run, that will tend to even out. Now, don't tell that to Kansas fans because they uh, have an incredible record in close games over the last three years. And, hey, even they lost uh, a close game finally at Arizona State. So it can happen even to KU. It can happen to anyone. But I think it's you know specific to Indiana having played – 13 games if some of those are close and some of those are close wins you know uh the the natural follow-up question is well okay who was the schedule against and i'm not sure there's too much you know shame in uh, again with uh due um qualifications made for for roster health and strength i'm, I'm not sure there's uh, too much shame in, in you know, winning uh, last possession contests at home against the likes of, you know, Louisville and Northwestern, or for that matter, in Indy, uh, well, not at Hinkle Fieldhouse, but in neutral floor Indy against Butler. I mean, those are those are worthy uh, opponents. So, all you know, and it's even more impressive to have uh, blown out uh, Marquette and people were talking big after that happened. So I'm not sure that playing close games is, is a red flag for the Hoosiers at, at this point, and it's definitely good to have won them. John, do you see uh, a lot of room for improvement for Indiana the rest of the way? Obviously, the turnovers are kind of a uh, persistent issue that maybe have come down a little bit in recent games, but still not where you would expect an Archie Miller coached team to be. And, um, but, but overall, I mean, does this team, do you feel like have a lot of room to get better the rest of the way? Or is this, you know, these close games, do you feel like this is kind of what Indiana is going to be, uh, given that we're, I guess, 30, 35% of the way through the season now? Uh, no, I, I do feel like something like turnover rate is much more amenable to improvement than, for instance, if you're not making your threes, uh, that's that's that can sometimes be more reflective of well, you just don't have guys who can hit those. But uh, turnover rates, and particularly if you drill down into you know what is happening with those, are they are they live ball? Are you are you uh, committing charging fouls? What exactly is happening? Uh, that you know can be really set upon and diagnosed and, and fixed. And obviously, when you're when you're talking about a team that in the early season against what I would classify as a respectable uh, strength of schedule, uh, the uh, or, or average strength of schedule, but I mean, not, uh, not disastrously bad by any means uh, with a team that's shooting as well as Indiana has, particularly inside the arc, obviously every single uh, possession without a turnover is, is precious and is to your benefit. Um, I don't expect that, Offensive rebounding numbers will change, uh, and by that I mean I don't expect that they will improve. Um, I've seen Archie Miller uh, opt for for this kind of style uh, one year in particular at Dayton, and uh, he it, it has worked for him, and I understand that. But again, the way to uh, maximize the shooting is just to uh, get a chance to shoot and to not turn the ball over. It's, it's not terribly complex. This is one of the the best shooting teams in the country right now, and uh, every every chance they have to score is is a clear benefit. So I do see room for improvement on offense. Uh, I think the defense is is basically good. Uh, I, you know, if they can continue what they're doing against uh you know uh, the uh, quality opponents in the big 10 and there's there's still 18 more games to play so i mean that's a long haul but if they can continue to do what the hoosiers have been doing on d 
um, then that should be uh, that should be about right. But I, I think that we could see some improvement on offense. There's been some midseason, or I don't know, we're not really midseason, but there's been some watch lists for National Player of the Year come out, and there, Jawan Morgan is a name that. I think a lot of IU fans maybe feel like deserve to be on a couple of those, but hasn't been. And, and there's also been some, just some early, uh, there was a tweet the other day from the big 10 network with one of their analysts, kind of five best players in the big 10 so far. And Jawan Morgan wasn't on it. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective. Uh, I, I think we can probably agree that Carson Edwards and Ethan Happ have kind of been the two best players, at least statistically right now. Um, in the Big Ten, but kind of where does where's Jawan Morgan fit in right now in your hierarchy of Big Ten players? Well, I got in on the ground floor of Jawan Morgan. I I'm not going to um, be so self reverential as to scroll through my old tweets here, but I had something out there a while back comparing his numbers uh, very favorably to Zion Williamson's, and with all due caveats, obviously he's not the the uh, the beast of offensive rebounding and, and foul drawing that Williamson is. And obviously he's got a very different date of birth. And as, as a result, the NBA is rightly much more interested in one guy than the other. But purely in terms of uh, college performance right now, and more specifically, purely in terms of uh, converting your twos and carrying your load on offense, uh, Morgan is outstanding. Um, I, I floated an idea at ESPN.com about a month ago that this is a golden age of two point shooters. Uh, Williamson was the poster boy for that article. Go figure. But uh, Morgan was name checked and with good reason. Uh, I feel like the, with all of the space that the increasing number of three point attempts is creating in the game as a whole, it, it's creating uh great opportunities for guys on the inside and Morgan is seizing on that moment uh, just as well as anybody in the country. And uh, of course, knocking down an occasional three as well. So uh, I expect to see him start popping up on those kinds of watch lists. And I feel like there's uh and, incre- and rightfully, I feel like perhaps there's an increasing uh, Ken Pomeroy effect in these discussions and that you need to have a little number uh, next to your name uh, for Ken Palm Player of the Year. And Morgan does not have that. Uh, you know, Ken's uh, algorithm prefers guys who uh, have a little higher workload than what Morgan has playing next to Langford. And I get that and I understand that. And I, I actually... Uh, generically agree with that uh, value judgment, but uh, Morgan is is pressing that envelope to an extreme. <laughs> and even though he's you know just air quotes here down around twenty four percent of possessions used. I mean, my gosh, when you're hitting uh, you know better than seventy five percent of your twos, I, I think it's time to uh, show a little love to the to the senior. So I've I've been very impressed with what Morgan's doing. And it's still early January. We still have uh, a layover effect of what the preseason expectations uh, were. I remember, I think, you know, a few years ago in February, I was having to ask, where is Carl Anthony Towns on lists like this? Nobody could, uh, nobody could pick him out among all of the Kentucky stars. So things do change eventually. Sometimes it's a little slower than it needs to be. But if Morgan keeps playing like this, it, it'll, it will definitely take care of itself. Juwan and Romeo have obviously been the most consistent players for Indiana, and they're carrying a heavy load. Is there anybody else on the roster who stands out to you as someone who needs to, you know, kind of step up and be more consistent uh, to 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 help those guys out as Indiana looks to compete in the Big Ten? Um, you know, that, that's a that's a loaded question because I feel like Indiana has done pretty well with a Big Two and. You know, having a big two, that's two more than some Big Ten teams that I could name that maybe we'll even be discussing a little later on uh, can number. So, you know, you can see this glass is half full. And obviously, if, if other people, you know, join this party, uh, the you know, more the merrier. But uh, whether it's it's timely threes from, from Fitzner or, you know, a, a stepped up 
uh, you know, workload from, from Duran Davis or, uh, whatever you might have, you know, that that's great. But I think that, uh, getting back to the, have we seen what we're going to see now that the, the season is about 35% spent? I think this is one area where we kind of have, um, you know, workloads uh, on offense tend to sort themselves out pretty darn early uh, in a college season, and then they they stay kind of stable. So um, that's not to say that you're not, of course, you're going to get a spectacular game from, you know, somebody that you didn't at all expect. That happens all the time. But in terms of continuing consistent contributions, um, I think this is a, a, a Langford Morgan kind of offense, and it, it's likely to stay that way. And again, that's uh, that's a good thing. And if they uh, shave some turnovers uh, as well, then it's it's a very very good thing. John, it's interesting you mentioned the workload. Uh, there's been some, and and I'll say this is a, I don't know if it's a just a vocal minority or just people who like to complain at anything when even when a team is eleven and two. Uh, just asking about Romeo Langford's usage and the number of shots that he gets. I mean, is his, when you kind of look at his Ken Palm numbers, I mean, he's obviously uh, the highest uh, usage player on Indiana's roster, but I mean, is there a, is there a case to be made to, to give him more opportunities or do you kind of look at his numbers and say, you know, based on his efficiency right now, he's about where he needs to be. No, I mean, uh, you know, when you've got a freshman who's who's well over you know sixty percent inside the arc, uh, yeah, give him as you know, give him as much as he can uh, he can take. Sure, uh, it, it would be it would be nice to see you know the uh, the free throw success rate just a, a smidge higher. He's he's just a, a shade under seventy percent, and you know that's that's fine, that's average. But for a guy who can convert inside the arc as well as he can and uh, can draw fouls the way Langford already has as a precocious freshman, then, you know, if you could get that uh, even just up to around 75%, then that's a, that's a clear benefit. So there's potential for added workload. As you said, it's a 26% now that's, that's nice and normal for a featured scorer. It's, it's not, uh, it's not outrageous by any means. And uh, in line with the previous question, you, you uh, Archie Miller or any coach is looking at these uh, questions in terms of available alternatives. And when you've got a one and done track freshman who is uh, converting inside the arc at the rate that Langford is, when you've got a guy who's got an offensive rating that's in effect 110 despite the fact that, you know, he can't make threes or has not made threes, I should say more accurately so far. Um, that is a, a strong marker of somebody who's got potential. So, uh, we might, uh, we might see an, an added workload for, for Langford in, in the near future. And there's nothing we're seeing so far that, uh, that warns us off that and says, wait, wait, that's not going to work on, on the contrary. I mean, every, you know, from his, from his age to his production to uh, you know the the opponents that Indiana has played, everything is is saying yeah that uh, that could work. Uh, try it and see. Hey, I'm going to jump in here real quick. We're about to get John's thoughts on the IU Illinois game coming up, but before we do that, I want to let you know that this episode of Podcast on the Brink is brought to you by our friends at Home Field and at HomeFieldApparel.com. You will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel that is available anywhere. Homefield was started by an IU grad, and all Homefield apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And with the Big Ten season upon us, you should check out Homefield's IU Basketball Champions tee featuring IU's five championship years, a feat that no other Big Ten school has accomplished. And I will continue to stump for the tri-blend fleece hoodie, which I absolutely love. It's got the old school Bison logo on it. I got so many messages and tweets from people who bought it over Christmas, which is awesome and great to hear. Now you are enjoying just the wonderful, heavenly softness of that incredible sweatshirt on the inside. And then on the outside, you've got the rugged IU Bison logo uh, there. But seriously, it's a great sweatshirt. uh, So certainly consider that when you're there at home field. And don't forget to use the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, at checkout because you will get 15% off your first order. And again, the website is homefieldapparel.com. And that promo code, once again, is BRINK, B-R-I-N-K. Homefield, 
wear one for the team. Now back to our conversation with John Gasway. Well, John, you alluded earlier to a team that we might talk about here in this show that uh, that would love to have two guys or just one, like Juwan Morgan or Romeo Langford. And that is the Illinois Fighting Illini, who Indiana will play on Thursday night. I believe I was I was looking back at the Ken Palm rankings. I believe this is the first time that since Rutgers joined the Big Ten that a team other than Rutgers has been the lowest ranked Big Ten team in Ken Palm's rankings, and that is Illinois right now. <laughs> the, you know, there was a lot of optimism. I feel like when Brad Underwood was was hired, it hasn't really it hasn't really happened a year and a half into his tenure. What's going on with the Illini? Is there a question here? <laughs> <laughs> Are you just breaking my heart? Um, for anybody just tuning in, uh, I'm, I am the uh, longest suffering Illinois fan who regularly occur, uh, appears on on this particular podcast. So uh, I, I, but I'm I'm taking off that hat and putting on my my ESPN hat uh, firmly. What's what's going on is that uh, we're we're in year two of a of a new coaching tenure and you know sometimes the new coach arrives and everything is more or less in place hey even when underwood you know arrived at oklahoma state uh he he had a couple guys that that he could lean on and it worked out you know great or well enough uh, relative to stillwater standards and uh they, they played a rather amazing round of 64 game shootout against michigan that year that the wolverines just barely won so it was on the strength of that that underwood was hired obviously uh, a much different early tenure in champagne uh we have seen situations like this uh work themselves out uh in the time scale of a coaching tenure um Oklahoma State did have a rather remarkable turnaround two years ago with Underwood, where they started. I, I believe it was zero and six, uh, and then they switched defenses, and, and all was right with the world. And they actually made the NCAA tournament, which is pretty amazing for a team to start conference play zero and six. Uh, I'm not waiting up nights waiting for that to happen with Illinois in 2019. So when I say things can work out, I mean across the time scale of a, to- a coaching tenure, not uh, in in 2019 specifically um illinois deficiencies are uh, manifest and easy to point at i love the fact that uh, a great amount of illinois uh, fan hair pulling is spent pointing at and berating the defense with the uh, huge caveat oh by the way the offense is even worse so it's like the old joke about bad food and such small portions. Um, you know, you uh, there's there's plenty to point at, and uh, this will be changed over time by uh, new players who are better, or by current players uh, getting older or better, and a uh, combination of both. But in the meantime, um, invoking Rutgers in the same sentence as Illinois. Uh, What's the line from Lawrence of Arabia? Uh, you tread heavily, but you speak the truth. <laughs> I, I think it makes its own point. So that's pretty much what's going on with the uh, with the fighting Illini in 2019. John, do you have a sense from Illinois fans or people follow the program? If there's is there panic? Is there um, kind of what's the what's the tip of of what people are are thinking at this point? Because it, it seems. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, the first year, they, they I think they won 14 games. But this year, you know, I don't think we're going out on a limb here to say that they, they'll be lucky to win 9 or 10. I mean, is there kind of what's the temperature of the fan base? Are people kind of becoming apathetic or are they is there still some hope that things can get turned around? Yeah, apathy, uh, for better or worse, is not something that Illinois fans are, are long on. They would, I mean, apathy... Um, is is implies that uh the losses no longer hurt uh that that is not my experience with uh illinois basketball fans uh now that's uh illinois fans reached that point long ago decades ago with football but (laughs) it's like uh you know, basketball is this last island that Illinois fans have retreated to, and they're going to they're going to make their stand here. So there's no way they're going to get apathetic about that. Uh, 
so no, it, it's not apathy and it's not panic, but um, I will say that we're months away, you know, calendar two, 2019 will be a uh, important year. I'll, pu- I'll put it that way because, you know, this is year two. Um, the players are the players and, and we've seen what they can do. They can improve. They can make some uh, some needed changes. Certainly a, a lower turnover rate on offense would be uh, wonderful and occasional made uh, two is is going to be important for this team going forward. Um, but you're, you're looking at a roster here with uh, limited minutes, uh, very limited minutes played by seniors, which means that what we see in year three of Underwood's tenure, um, that will, um, that will be important. And, um, we're, we're going to get to that point in the relative, uh, blink of an eye. Uh, it's, you know, it seems like a long way away because we've got an entire big 10 season to play yet. We don't know how that's going to play out, but, uh, in reality, it's what is it? You know, it's only we're, we're talking about ten or eleven months of real non basketball time. So when you uh, when you check in with me, then it will be much less of you know my my reportage on the Illinois fan community will be much less of a wait and see matter. And then once you're talking about year three, um, it's it's it will be more of a all right, you know, what what have you done for us lately? Kind of point of view and uh looking for for signs of improvement by that point but yeah for now uh looks uh, your your nine or ten games assessment uh would would it has solid grounding and uh that is the way it is in year two unfortunately you mentioned that there's not very many seniors playing minutes on this roster aaron jordan i think is really the only uh, is he the only senior on the roster? Well, the, there's the grad transfer. Yeah, the, only, the only senior starter. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So, looking ahead, who are maybe one or two guys that a year from now, if Illinois turned things around, you're going to say, "Wow, that 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 guy is the reason why." Obviously, Trent Frazier and yeah, and the freshman guard from Chicago. Do yeah, you yeah. feel like those two are, are are building blocks potentially for a turnaround? Yeah, I mean that's what needs to happen. You need you need Desumu to to take the. Uh, the proverbial sophomore leap, you know, he's, he's already making threes uh, and you just need him to become the, the uh, complete player and uh, score inside the arc, you know, draw those fouls, um, make those free throws, uh, boost that assist rate. And then uh, same with, with Trent Frazier, you know, there, there is some uh, agonizing irony in the fact that, you know, this is actually a pretty fair three point shooting team. And there have been, years during the drought where uh, an Illinois fan would have would have killed for a, a modicum of, of three-point shooting. Now we've got it and not much else is going right. So, you know, seeds of hope performance-wise, but, um, you know, again, uh, y- you need talent. And I'm not, uh, you know, uh, Indiana fans of a certain age have, you know, lived through a, a total and complete rebuild a decade ago, and I'm I'm not telling uh, IU fans anything that they didn't live. Uh, you you need the current players you have to get older and hopefully better, and you need new players, and uh, it's it's not going to happen uh, exclusively with either of uh, either of those paths uh, isolated from the other. You you need both when you're when you're trying to do a significant improvement and Illinois is, is clearly going to be needing both, but uh, yeah, you, you do see some, some good things from Desumu and, and Frazier above others. So uh, uh, keep hope alive. John, tell me if I'm crazy or not. I mean, obviously there's a lot of reasons to expect that Indiana will win on Thursday, you know, playing at home, Illinois has been struggling, And yet, you know, I kind of look at some of the things that Illinois does well. You know, Illinois forces turnovers. They're, you know, pretty good three-point shooting team. We just found out that Rob Finnessy is not going to play because he's still dealing with his, you know, concussion symptoms. And that's obviously, you know, another steady ball handler not in the mix against a team playing pressure defense. Am I just being neurotic or are there, you know, some reasons to think that this is going to be a trickier game for Indiana than maybe you would think at first glance? 
It has that potential. And for reasons that you outlined in your, your question and that we've outlined uh, collectively here in previous questions, uh, say what you will about Illinois, and I've, I've said it all, uh, they do force turnovers. They, they get a high percentage of takeaways. And if you know Indiana doesn't have that completely nailed down, then there is the, uh, there is the scenario where that becomes an issue even at home. Um, Illinois won, you know, some, some road games to speak of. Uh, so it, it, it can, uh, happen. It took all year last year, <laughs> but they won at Rutgers finally. So, you know, their road record in, in recent times and specifically under Brad Underwood is, is not such that will make Indiana fans, uh, quake in their boots. It would be a clear upset, but, uh, it's possible crazier things have happened and for it to occur uh, this time, Illinois is going to need early success and uh, get in the game and then uh, hold on for dear life until the end. But again, uh, this is uh, far from the most remote scenario that we've seen in college of basketball this year. And uh, every, uh, dire scenario that we've just referred to here is something that Archie Miller can can and is truthfully sharing with his team. So um, I'll definitely be watching uh, the game and specifically the first half to see how that plays out with Illinois and Indiana this week. John, in terms of the Big Ten at large right now, if you had to, obviously I think everyone would agree that Michigan's the favorite, but who are the other teams that you see as legitimate contenders to actually win the league besides Michigan? Um, you know, I, that's an excellent question because I feel like uh, I want to add Wisconsin to that list, but I, I, I'm not ready, quite ready to pull that trigger. Um, I, I think it might instead be a Michigan, Michigan state uh, kind of thing. And I know that's the, maybe the expected answer, but, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, to writ large, uh, we didn't know that Michigan was going to be as good as they are. So even the expected answer is, is unexpected if you go back far enough. Um, you know, uh, Wisconsin, I just, I, I'm not completely, uh, sold yet on what they can do, uh, defensively. And, you know, they're, coming off a, a loss at Western Kentucky. And, you know, if they hadn't scheduled that game, they wouldn't have lost it. So I'm not necessarily holding that against them. But, um, it, it, you know, I, I like, you know, I'm totally sold on Michigan, obviously. I, I don't know why somebody would not be. Um, Michigan State, you know, I totally uh, – buying into what they can do offensively. And I think that they're uh, able to offset uh, some, some potential defensive liabilities. Um, you know, Nick Ward is actually seeing, you know, north of 50% minutes. So that's a, that's a positive development for the Spartans. And as, uh, as expected as it might be, I, I do, I do see, the Spartans and the Wolverines uh, coming in as, as the co-favorites in the Big Ten race. But again, uh, we're, we're not used to being in early January with uh, fully 18 games yet to play. So uh, once we get like a third of the remaining games under our belts, and that's only going to be like, you know, two and a half, three weeks from now, uh, we will know so much more. And uh, that's what I love about conference play is that it just races you down the learning curve. So uh, I'm looking forward to those, uh, those early season expectations being uh, upended and uh, finding out who really is going to uh, chase perhaps Michigan and, and make this a race. It, it, it does tend to happen uh, most years. Final question for you, John, any, like dark horse candidate that you like in the Big Ten, maybe one of the teams that's outside of the top twenty-five that you think maybe not compete for the Big Ten title, but they could finish, you know, in the top four or five that would really surprise people. Well, I'm going to go with a dark dark horse. Uh, I like Maryland uh, as dark horse potential, just because I, I think uh, 
bringing this uh, all the way back to our uh, our <laughs> idolatry of uh, earned idolatry of Juan Morgan and uh, golden age of two pointers. I, I think Bruno Fernando is uh, kind of working from that same page, and uh, I, I think that uh, Mark Turgeon has uh, a lot to uh, put around Fernando and and the talent that it takes i I don't think that they're going to be any great shakes on defense the terrapins this year but i you know you're asking for dark horse Canada, so i'm i'm going down in the middle of the pack and saying i could envision scenarios where maryland is is better than they're expected to be and uh above 500 in the in the big 10 and and winning some impressive games at home and stealing a couple on the road uh i you know it's it's uh it's standard to say that the Big Ten is good this year. I think the Big Ten is good this year. and It's got some some depth and some strength, and I think Maryland is is kind of the proof of that. Um, they they are a very much middle of the pack Big Ten team, but uh, the kind of uh, outfit that let's not forget, you know, they they effectively played Virginia into the 40th minute at home during the ACC Big Ten Challenge. It looked like uh, the Cavaliers had that kind of in hand at one point, and then. Maryland just kept eating away and eating away. And then it was uncomfortably close for Tony Bennett at the very end. That's a, uh, that's a pretty good read on a team. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely open to uh, the dark horse uh, credentials being stamped by Maryland this year. Well, John, we always appreciate your visits to podcast on the brink. Hopefully uh, from your perspective, things get much better uh, in Champaign here moving forward, although not Thursday night. Let's wait for the turnaround to, you know, to happen after that. But we always appreciate you coming and, uh, and we look forward to the next time that we get to chat. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And things uh, will get better. This is uh, this is the bottom. <laughs> so <laughs> there's uh, there's only one direction and I'm, I'm looking forward to that direction. It'll be uh, it'll be a fun time. Thanks, Thanks, John. John. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers.